Coming up, we're dressed for all seasons. A winter boot sets trends in the city. I need those duck boots. <laughs> a touch of gold goes a long way. A floral dress gets us in the mood for spring. And we dive right into a summer bikini with a healthy splash of color. The more booty is showing, the better. This is Style Factory. They're itty, they're bitty, and come summertime, bikinis inspire a certain passion. Two-piece all the way, and the skimpier, the better bikinis. Done. Who could forget 1962, the first Bond film, where Honey Rider just emerges from the ocean with this beautiful bikini? I'm saying if you have the confidence, go for it. The more booty is showing, the better. I do not like tan lines. I like the colors and the fabrics, and I like everything about bikinis. And of course, there's a wide array of bikini styles to choose from. There's the boy shorts, there's the Brazilian cut. There's also like, what is, what would you call that? High-waisted eight, yes. There's all different types. When I'm shopping for a bikini, I'm looking for style. I'm ensuring that everything is locked and loaded and it has to be comfortable. For results like these, women turn to Shan. Oh, I love Shan, sorry. I just bought like five bikinis. <laughs> Chantelle Levike is the founder and designer of this Montreal-based swimwear brand. We took my clients on the vedette, finally. Or at least they feel that way, wearing her vintage-inspired piece, the Balcone. A bikini Shan's designed to be worn anywhere casual, and not just the beach. And vraiment, the maillot qui ressemble le plus, l'élément prêt à porter dans notre garde-robe. Chantal and her team make the simple bikini glamorous using high-end corsetry and made-to-measure techniques. Uh, la caractéristique principale d'un produit Chan, uh, c'est sûrement le raffinement et l'élégance. They get inspired while they travel to Italy and uh, get the new fabric. So that's how they really start this with the fabric. For the balcony, that's a 75% polymede and 25% spandex blend in rich sapphire blue. It's laid out, measured, and a computerized pattern or marker is printed and placed over top. Each of the bikini's individual pieces is paired with a corresponding barcode, and the fabric is vacuum sealed for protection. These barcodes act as a roadmap for the automated cutter, which uses speed and precision to create the suit's individual parts. The result will be a belly-bearing look of atomic proportions. Where does the word bikini actually even come from? Well, after World War II, they were doing a big atomic test in a region called Bikini Atoll. The designer decided, let's call it bikini. Who knew? And its evolution was just as much about function as it was style. During the Second World War, there had been fabric shortages. Rationing was put in place to make sure that fabric went towards the war effort. So this actually helped the popularity of the two-piece. Today's bikini covers the same ground, with the added benefit of a whole lot of hardware. Well-tailored straps, loops, buckles, and a solid clasp are details that mean this bikini will stand the test of time. You can either buy super cheap ones and wear them for one summer and just throw them out, or you invest in a good one that's gonna stay nice longer. Shan's sewing process proves that a good quality bikini is just as complicated to make as it is to shop for. Seamstresses sew together two foam pieces that shape each cup of the bustier. Then they're lined with slip-resistant netting and any excess is trimmed. The cut and sorted fabric is brought over to the sewing line. Here, Maria carefully prepares each piece, sewing with precision to create three flattering pleats, and then closes them with strategically placed darts. The fabric that covers the form is like one of the most important steps because it's really what gives the look to the bra. And both cups are attached with what's called a center gore. But in order to push up, the bra top needs some support from underneath. So the underwire casing is sewn into the bustier. 
Then, the plastic boning strip is inserted in a semicircle that travels from the center gore to the armpit. This helps lift, shape, separate, and support. It's a small detail, but this underwire is the key to a perfect bus line. Amy Schumer would actually look good in a two-piece uh, push-up. Oh, yeah, with those boobies. Very sexy, very Marilyn Monroe-ish. I feel like this would look good on any type of body because it has like a push-up bra built in. And the way that the strap comes up, it's super flattering. An elastic gets sewn onto the back of the bikini top, and it's carefully folded and sewn with a zigzag stitch. It's a silicone elastic, so it grips, so it can hold without the straps. I think it's an amazing thing that you can remove the straps from your bikini, because you don't want to have the tan lines. I don't want anything digging into me. I'm on the beach. I want to have a good time. I don't want to be thinking about what I'm wearing. Finally, the back buckle is inserted. And each bikini is labeled and packaged. So you can hit the beach in style. Bright blue bikinis look amazing with white shirts. You can just go to your boyfriend's closet and steal one and just wear an oversized, super cool white shirt. Whatever you wear it with, make sure you're beach ready as well. Oh my gosh, please get a wax before you wear a bikini. Please get a wax, period, because you never know what could happen. Sometimes style comes from strange places, like this glorious piece of footwear. An outdoorsy, wet weather boot now trending on city streets across North America. The original L.L. Bean boot, made with waterproof rubber and tan leather, AKA the duck booty. Is that a duck? Shouldn't it be like a, uh, don't you have like a, some kind of beak? That's a fish, I think. That's, there. That's a duck, right? L.L. <laughs> Bean duck boots are like the urban man's jungle boot. I think it's great. I like duck boots for walking the dogs when the grass is wet. Or like if I actually see a puddle, I'll actually jump into it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you feel like a duck, which I like. Well, that's good, because the duck boot doesn't exactly have what we might call universal appeal. I wouldn't wear duck boots, but that's not to say they can't look great sometimes styled on other people. Is it really a high fashion statement? No, it's more kind of funny, cute street style and nobody's happier about it than L.L. Bean's very tall CEO, who can't make the boots fast enough. They become incredibly popular, and we can only produce so many boots, about 12,000 pairs a week. And leading up into Christmas, we get tens of thousands of orders. Steve and his team try to keep up with demand here, in this 130,000 square foot factory in Brunswick, Maine. The duck boots are essentially made of two major components. The tan leather vamp, that's this upper part of the boot, and the rubber, yellow and brown, or black, boot bottom. And the first step is the last. A last is a foot-shaped template used to mold the rubber bottoms, but not before adding a tiny little sock. This is the sock right here. Uh, it's a silk sock that we insert on the last. And what it does is it allows the boot to release from the mold a lot easier. It doesn't stick like a rubber would to a piece of metal. Some rubber starts as natural rubber, which comes from a white sap-like liquid inside rubber trees. But natural rubber is increasingly in short supply. So the duck boots are made from a synthetic thermoplastic rubber, or TPE. The rubber boot bottoms are injection molded using this enormous injection molder. Once it's solidified on the last, the rubber is perfectly watertight, essential for the duck boots' primary customer. Duck boots were first worn by hunters who had to trail through marshy areas as they were hunting things like ducks, clearly. L.L. Bean was um, an outdoorsman here in Maine. Uh, he made the first pair of boots in 1911. He was frustrated with old hunting boots, which would get waterlogged. So he had the idea of putting a, a rubber bottom with a leather upper together. Now that the boot bottoms are molded, Scott adds a quick label before sending them over to the assembly station. Then, the boot's leather ankle piece starts as a single sheet of leather that gets die cut into several smaller pieces. All the boot's leather components get stitched together, forming the ankle shape. When it's leather, they will mold and form to your ankle and become incredibly comfortable. And now that the top vamps are stitched, the lace hole eyelets are punched in. 
The eyelet machine is fairly violent. It punches the hole through the leather, and it pops the metal ring on both sides of it. With the eyelets in, the leather uppers and rubber bottoms are ready to be joined. First, a waterproof glue called cement is brushed onto the bottoms and tops. The tops and bottoms are now stuck together before getting a good old-fashioned vamping. Vamping is the final triple stitch uh, that goes around where the leather meets the rubber. While the boots are stitched together, Gwen here checks on the waterproof inner linings. This one has a hole in it. We'll have to fix that. It has to pass a certain process to make sure that it's waterproof. So those all get assembled, and then they get put into the upper when the boot is assembled. The weatherproof nature of these boots is what's taken them from practical necessity to ironic accessory to stylish fashion piece. Ella Bean really kind of had a moment with the whole preppy culture of the 80s. Now, it's a new generation of hip young kids keeping L.L. Bean so busy. I don't know what the driver of that was, but they're now really popular with, with college kids. That 20-something slacker culture where looking a bit slobby when you're really intelligent is kind of cool. I need those <laughs> duck boots. Even with like, you know, like a faux fur jacket with the duck boots and a pair of leggings. Yes, like I love when it's like, I like when so it's wrong, it's right. Effortless. Finally, the boots are matched with the linings, laces, and insoles at the inspection station. And they're ready to trudge through swamps, shovel snow, hunt ducks, or jump in puddles in style. When summer arrives, every girl needs the perfect floral midi dress. They've been a stylish staple since the 40s and make perfect summer companions. A summery dress in a floral pattern is something that every woman should have in her wardrobe. It's just so easy and breezy. And in the summertime, it's all about that nonchalance, and a dress kind of gives you that. When I think of like summery dresses, I think of the celebrities at Coachella rock in these dresses. Taylor Swift, uh, Kylie Jenner, uh, Rihanna. Cue the Christy Dawn Lucille midi dress in black crepe with a very on-trend, brightly colored floral print, finished with a sexy little drawstring on the front. So it has a lot of things going on. Christy Dawn is the 29-year-old visionary behind the Lucille dress. So the Lucille dress is definitely a prairie town girl dress. I envisioned this French woman in the French country wearing our dresses in the middle of a field. But the Lucille dress starts far from any field, as a nearly forgotten roll of discarded fabric stored in her favorite Los Angeles, California warehouse. When we first launched our dress company, we used this brown fabric. Sometimes we'll get 200 yards of something. And if it's really special, we'll get seven yards of something and make one woman a really special dress. These fabrics are all dead stock, used material that would otherwise be sent to a landfill. Fashion is really wasteful when it comes to fabrics, so we wanted to avoid creating more waste. Recycling dead stock fabric isn't just a California eco-crusader thing to do. It's also picking up steam with major players in fashion. This whole movement of designers using dead stock fabric, to me, really emerged with Mucha Prada. People really gravitated to them because sometimes the tricky thing about fashion is that it's here and then gone. This is the fabric that I chose for the Lucille dress. Finding a print that has the flowers spaced apart like this is really rare, I find, in, in dead stock fabric. We'll never know where it came from or why it's so soft. <laughs> That's the beauty of the dead stock fabric. Back at Christie's modest 5,000 square foot studio, that very fabric is about to become the latest Lucille. First, the dress designs are digitally broken down into individual components. Then the components are printed onto a long sheet of paper and laid out over the crepe fabric. An automatic cutting machine traces the shapes to cut the individual pieces of the dress. The first phase of dress assembly is with the skirt. 
falling somewhere between the ankle and the knee, the skirt's length is what makes a midi dress a midi dress. But that creates a high wire act of a dress for some ladies. A midi dress can be difficult because it tends to cut your leg in half, and particularly if you're already petite, you don't necessarily want to lose any more height. I always tell my petite friends, if they want to wear mid skirts, it's fine but wear high heels. Show your shoulders or show some skin. I always recommend to women that are shorter, take it to your seamstress or your tailor and just take off inches at the bottom. The top part of the dress is the torso and short sleeves, which are sewn together. Next, the fabric is run through a binding machine to make quarter inch elastic edges for the waist and sleeve seams. And the binding is what keeps the fabric together so it doesn't move. So it just gives it that structure. With the two halves done, they're stitched together at the waist. As the dress is realized, you can easily visualize Christie's fictional French farm girl wearing it. Or maybe Christie's muse is closer to home. I grew up on 10 acres with horses and chickens and my mom and I would go shopping at vintage thrift shops. We would come home and my mom would alter them to fit me. Watching her put the energy and the love into the sewing was really special to see. No doubt Christie's mom inspired some of the Lucille's details, like the neat little drawstring. Finally, the Christie Dawn label is sewn in. And voila, Christie's Lucille midi dress is ready to go day or night. In the daytime, I could rock it with, uh, you know, gladiator sandals, a jean jacket. And in the nighttime, now I'll switch it up, throw on some strappy stilettos, and have my hair up if I'm not wearing a weave, right, and call it a night. No matter how or when it's worn, the Lucille dress has a built-in vintage nostalgia that's hard to deny. I love vintage because it's, it's one of a kind. There's just this mystery about it. The easiest way to make a fashion statement is with a bold piece of jewelry. I love gold, I love silver, I love platinum, I love them together. And I love to mix them and match them. And what's more loud and clear than a gold cuff? A gold cuff is a very ostentatious form of statement jewelry. It certainly says bling if you're wearing a gold cuff. Very Cleopatra, very Chanel, very Wonder Woman. Behold, the parallel cuff a slotted symmetrical bangle that's setting the gold standard for jewelry. The woman who's wearing it is wearing it because she loves design and she wants to make a statement. Dean Davidson is the jewelry's designer, a former farm boy from rural Manitoba who has made quite a name for himself in Hollywood. Jessica Alba, Olivia Wilde, Demi Moore, Rihanna. Yeah, we've had a lot of celebrities who won the product. But as a Canadian boy, he's particularly proud of one customer. Canada's fashion-forward first lady, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. It's just a, a very proud moment, you know, to have the Prime Minister's wife wearing your jewelry. The famous bracelets are made in Dean's Toronto studio. Just when I started designing, I, I loved working with very clean lines and creating pieces that were very wearable and timeless. And um, I found that through being inspired by architecture. Production starts with a hand-drawn sketch, which is then put through a 3D modeling program to get an idea of what the cuff will look like once it's made. The line sh uh, should be about five to eight millimeters in width. Perfect. And the cuff should have a taper to it. But the bracelet doesn't start off good as gold. Once the pattern is printed, it's cut out and taped onto a metal base. Gold plating is real gold, but it's not gold all the way through. It's an outer layer of gold on another metal, usually something like copper or silver. In this case, it's brass, which is an alloy of zinc and copper. It has a shiny, smooth surface that makes it perfect for plating. Samantha starts the totally handmade process by tracing the pattern onto the brass with a marker, using a ruler to draw the cuff's symmetrical cutouts. Then, tiny holes are drilled into the cutouts, and the saw's paper-thin blade is slipped through. Samantha saws the angular slices by hand, once the bracelet has taken its final shape, the edges are filed, smoothing them out. The brass is heated, making it easier to work with. The metal is thin enough that it's slightly malleable, so that you can shape it. Which Samantha does once she cools the hot brass in cold water and puts it on a steel form. I'm using a rawhide mallet so it doesn't mar the metal in any spots. 
so it'll leave it as a nice finish, no scratches. I'm paying attention to symmetry as I'm doing this, and I want it to be comfortable on the wrist. With the cuff back on the workstation, she applies Dean's signature texture using a sanding tool. I've used the brush finish on my work from day one. It's created this cohesiveness within the collection. So pieces from my very first collection, you can wear with the most recent designs. The pieces are pieces that you will have for a lifetime. But not before they're coated. The buffed cuffs are taken through a series of baths that clean them and coat them as well. It's dipped in copper. The copper X is a barrier to prevent the brass from oxidizing through so that the gold finish will last longer. Then they get their final 24 karat coating. The cuff has an electrode attached to it. The current moves through the piece, and that's what makes the gold adhere to the cuff. And gives it a gold star of approval. I could see this with a beautiful column slim fitting dress and one single cuff, and that would be amazing. You just need to be super careful if you're a petite, because if you wear a really big cuff, it can cut off your length. I love gold cuffs. I think, you know, if you're gonna get a gold cuff, get two. I don't think you can stack cuffs. It's very uncomfortable. It it's kind of sitting cool. there like this. And it's very hard to hold a dog when you have two cuffs on. It's very hard to hold, <laughs> do anything. It's very hard to text. When it comes to jewelry, I think that less is more. <laughs>